This is the story of a family who was once a family of six, and they thought they were complete. But then they became a family of eight, and then a family of 11, all thanks to adoption. This is Life with the Littletons. We're gonna go ahead and just jump right into your story, Trevor and Shanna Littleton. Four biological kids, but God did not say that was the end of your family. No. Let's talk about how God decided to grow your family to where it is now. Yeah, so I was adopted when I was a little one, so I was less than a year old when I was adopted, and it has always been a part of my own story. Um, so we had supported a mission in Haiti, uh, our church, when we lived in Millersburg, and we helped them build a medical clinic and help raise money and do some of that work, and they had a little girl who was orphaned to the ministry. And they knew our heart for adoption and our desires to do that. And uh, that little girl, we had, we had looked into adopting her. It became impossible to adopt her, but we still supported her from here. We would send clothes and food and everything to her. I got to hold her one time, uh, one of our mission trips, we were there. And then a few months later, they called us and they said, uh, we don't know how to tell you this, but she passed away. And it was just a, uh, a respiratory illness that here in America, it would have been a quick trip to urgent mm -hmm. care. And down there, it just it, it took her. So we were devastated, obviously, and um, we had already considered adopting her, and, and so we were in the mindset to do it. So we thought, let's let's pull this thread and see where it goes. We didn't want to pursue Haiti anymore. With that, there were just a lot of a lot of hurts there. So uh, Ukraine was as far away from Haiti as possible, <laughs> and uh, we had reached out. We were considering maybe Colombia adoption, and then uh, the organization we had reached out to had rerouted us to Ukraine. And we thought, you know, we, we already have four biological kids. Uh, we, we were not interested in adopting a baby or, or someone young. So our, our mentality was, what are the situations that people typically aren't adopting today? Like what, um, what are people kind of afraid to touch? And one of the things that we had come across was sibling adoptions. So we, we thought, you know what, we're crazy enough, we'll, we'll do this. And so we looked into adopting uh, a set of siblings. So we went through the home study and they said, hey, we'll prove you for a five-year-old girl and a three-year-old boy. And so we pretty much went through that process and that's where a lot of it started. Yeah. So a five-year-old girl and a three-year-old boy, yes. siblings. They were not biological siblings by the right. time. So we, we were going into it thinking we would have a uh, biological sibling set. And then the way Ukraine works is they don't officially pair you until you're in country. There was a sibling set we thought we might be paired with right before we traveled. And right before we traveled, a Ukrainian family had adopted them. So we went in blind. So we pretty much went in not knowing who we were going to end up with. They pretty much give you recommendations. And so they had given us a recommendation. They weren't biological, but they fit uh, our family the same profile. Criteria. So how long ago was that, that you were in that process of getting ready to adopt these next two children in your family? That was in 2015, our first adoption. And walk me through that process that it took to actually go there. Um, did you go to the Ukraine? Did you both go to the Ukraine? We, we both went. Um, both of our adoptions, the process was actually very different in a lot of ways. Um, but the first process we did, we took two trips and we both went uh, both times um, because there's this time frame between the time that you go and you get your initial referral and then the time that you have court and then you have the waiting period and the days that they give you to, um, they permit you to get the children out of the orphanage. So. Um, that was that was about a month. That took about a month mm. process, the so first time. So we're talking a lot of technical things that go along with an adoption. Yes. And I, I want to talk a little bit about your daughter's story because there, there's some amazing things in there. Yeah. Um, but heart-wise, what was going on in your heart as, as all of this was happening? You have four kids. You know, you already have larger than the typical American family, but yet God has not settled you and something more needs to happen. Where, where it all started for us, um, our, our relationship with, with Haiti and, and all that, uh, and how that transpired, but I had just finished writing a book called Boundless, and the whole book was just a narrative retelling of the signature moments of faith through the Old Testament. So I was in the middle of writing the book, and I'm knee deep with rewrites and all that stuff there, and I felt plain as day, uh, you know, Trevor, you, you are writing about faith. What are you doing to back this up? Like what? is going to be your your epic moment and so i was literally I was, I was doing a chapter on moses and his life and leading israel through what that he did and um it just really hit me that yeah like i'm authoring a book on faith what am i doing that's different and unique to, to back up what i'm putting out here and we were already in process all the, the stuff had, had already happened there 
and it just really opened up that it was time to do something that uh, we would always say kind of in our family that faith is an adventure and, and it was definitely time to, to take that adventure. Of course, the adventure of adopting includes a lot of financial uh, yeah. things. It includes a lot of life changes, yeah. um, a lot of things happening. And in your case, it also included uh, bringing in a daughter who was a, a, a prisoner of war in a yeah. sense. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about that story. So when we, um, we met our son, Roman, first, and we had met him in the orphanage a week prior. So we met him on Tuesday, had our time, spent that time. Then the next Tuesday, we traveled about four hours away to Kharkiv, which is um, close, pretty close to the Russian border. And we get out of the car, we meet our uh, facilitator, and she gets us in, and we're now en route to the children's hospital. And she turns around and she said, uh, I, I have to tell you a story about your daughter. And she said, your daughter was held hostage for three days. And she just goes on to this story and we're, we're awestruck by, wait, can we back up to the hostage part? And I just had the look of disbelief because it's just not something you hear every day. Mm -hmm. And she could read my face pretty well and my expressions and she knew what I was thinking. She said, no, listen, she said, go, go Google it. And she gave me the name of the orphanage. She gave me the name of the village and the date everything had occurred. So we went and we met Rye. We spent that time with her. And then when we came to the apartment that night, we went on Google and we pulled it up. And uh, we found it was a 13 minute long uh, video documentary of um, basically what had happened was some separatists, they called them hostels, had come in, seized the orphanage. They had held everybody hostage. They moved all the children to the top floor. Uh, there were 168 children. They used them as human shields to prevent from airstrikes because uh, rules of war and engagement, you cannot bomb a school, a church, or an orphanage. So they had taken over the orphanage to begin their work into the city. So they moved all the children to the top floor. Uh, and essentially there was a nurse who was very brave and who went outside and she wrote in Russian, SOS, do not bomb children inside on a sheet. They put the bed sheets on the, the playground, they weighed it down with toys, then they smuggled 34 children out um, onto the road to get them away. They wrote their names on their forearms so they could later match their records and they just left. Mm. They were intercepted by the hostels and then there was a three day standoff um, after that. And, and it, Russian media outlets were there, Ukrainian media outlets were there. There was a lot of just negotiating back and forth and, and people putting their own political spin on it. But at the end of the day, um, we were watching this video and sure enough, there's a soldier carrying the girl we had just met that day um, out of an ambulance and escorting her to another ambulance for her train or for her ride back to uh, Kharkiv, which was their safe place. I think that was, yeah, it was amazing. It was such an overwhelming feeling to, cause that's not the typical standard um, information that they give you when you're going through the adoption process. Yeah, that one so, wasn't on a paper before. Yeah, then. no, and not at all. So it was, you know, this, you see this child that you are, you know, you've pursued and you agreed to adopt and then you see this, unbelievable story unfold and it was it was just a lot to take in well and here knowing that she had been through that scenario yet through the entire time god knew that you too would be her parents yeah. and would be the ones to walk her through the healing process oh of that my. and everything else and now you have her here and, yeah. and so the first time that we were ever around fireworks with her because there was so much shelling and bombing there that the first time we were around fireworks with her and then the other little one we adopted in our second adoption, it, it, we didn't realize just the trauma that would recur mm. from some of these things and how much work we had to do to explain, honey, this isn't a bomb, this is actually a celebration and, and the, the comfort that was needed. It's just such a unique type of approach that we had to take as parents to, to comfort her. So. so let's talk about then your second adoption. In your mm -hmm. first adoption, you adopted a, a boy and a girl. Mm -hmm. What happened then in your next adoption? Um, our second adoption, um, we were actually uh, hosting uh, through an orphan hosting program where they bring children who are in an orphanage into families for a short period of time. <clears throat> and so we agreed to host a, a girl one winter for Christmas. And um, it was a situation where she was with us for two weeks and asked to live with us. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there were we, many tears in that conversation. Yeah, it, we weren't necessarily just two weeks time. Yeah, yeah, she was asking to live because with, with orphan hosting um, winter is a little bit shorter. It's usually about four weeks. And so she knew in two weeks she was going to be returning home. Mm -hmm. And I think the to panic, the correct, the, the panic had set in as far as when I go back, this family environment, the, the, the love and, and the, the safety that is there 
it's not going to be waiting for me when I return to Ukraine. I think she was starting to have some of those panic moments. And uh, it led to some hard conversations and a lot of tears. Yeah, because we weren't, I mean, we weren't, that wasn't the path that we thought we were going to go on again because hosting isn't necessarily adoption. Mm -hmm. um, so when she had asked, you know, it, it kind of turned into where our first adoption process was just, you know, stepping out on faith and, and having this boundless faith. Um, our second adoption was, was more, you know, how obedient are you to God's calling? Mm -hmm. And I, there is a difference. And I think for both of our adoption processes, they were, we approached them very differently. So you're talking about one girl that was in your house, mm -hmm. but you didn't just adopt one no. child. <laughs> no, Surprise, we found out she, she had a, a sister. sister. <laughs> <laughs> so um, that was a little bit of a, you know, like this, this bonus child that we didn't even know existed at the time. And they had like no information because of the war, records were kind of scattered. So the girls were not in the same orphanage. And so they were at risk. Uh, Ukraine typically doesn't separate siblings, but the way that they were age difference wise, they were in a position where the country and the orphanage could have petitioned to separate them. So there was a risk of them not being together pretty much from that point forward. Um, so we securing the, the adoption, it made it okay where we were able to adopt both girls, keep them together. And then we were approved for a third child. Well, there was another family in our church who had hosted a boy from their same orphanage. Um, he was 16 and he was going to turn 16. And at 16 in Ukraine, it's like our 18, you're an adult, you're, you're done. So it pretty much was the streets were waiting for him. Wow. So we were already approved for one more. So it was like, you know what? We already have all these kids, <laughs> you know, one more, you know, going from a family of eight kids to nine kids, whatever, we'll just pull the trigger. And he's, he's been a wonderful blessing. He's really prospered and, and thrived here. How has this been for your family, your, your biological children, mm -hmm. who, who um, whether they agreed or not, this was the avenue mom and dad were taking. And so how has this cohesiveness been for your entire family? It's, it's been interesting. Honestly, uh, like great. none of our kids were against or opposed to it. Um, I don't ever really remember a moment where they, yeah. you know, really struggled with the thought of that. When we brought Raya so. home on our first adoption, uh, Brielle, who's now nine, I think at the time she would have been six, yeah. looking back, but she was teary eyed and she was tearful when we brought them home. And I remember thinking like, honey, are you okay? And she's like, I'm just really happy. And so that's pretty much been their mentality. I mean, there's sibling squabbles and stuff yeah. as you mm -hmm. always have, but they, uh, they, they've been really blessed. And I think they, they understand that these are kids who didn't have a family. They love the mm -hmm. fact that they have a family. And our, our younger son, uh, who always walk around, I love our family. And I think he understands that here were some kiddos who, who would never have had that opportunity. So they, they've been very welcome. We've been blessed with their attitude. Bring, yeah, bring we really home. have. Would you say that that's just evident of God confirming oh, yes. that oh, this absolutely. was yeah. what you need to be doing? And, yeah. and I tell you, have, being on the parental side of adoption, where uh, we have adopted some kids from, from some hard places and, and with some trauma, um, to compare that with, you know, I see these children as my own, you know, all the brokenness, all the trauma and everything that can happen. If, if this is a glimpse of what grace is like, as far as how he sees us, the blending together of people from all sorts of walks of life and, and to create what it is for the church and to see uh, his love for us and the traumas we've been through and, and the unconditional love. Mm -hmm. If adoption is, is a glimpse of that, which we know biblically it is, it really is, is a powerful thing where even on understanding God through grace, it becomes even more beautiful to, to appreciate it that way. So let's move this um, conversation to people who might be thinking, yeah, I, I think God is, is working on my heart to do this, but, I, but, but what about this? And but what about this? And I'm just not sure, you know, what, what would you advise now? Because obviously the children you adopted, those are not the only five no. kids that need to find forever homes. No. So globally, there's about 153 million, in excess of 153 million children who are orphaned. Um, that includes the, the orphans who live in America. So for American, uh, we believe there's about 400, and in excess of 400,000 children in foster care today, um, which we could say is the population of maybe a Cincinnati or an Atlanta or something to that effect. Um, that's a lot of kids. And only about 100,000 children are adopted every year in America. So there's 300,000 plus just who aren't adopted from foster care. Uh, many of the 100,000 children a year who are adopted are like a step-parent adoption or uh, maybe parents have deceased or an aunt and uncle would adopt a child. Uh, so they're not even all foster care adoptions. And only about 4,000, almost 5,000 children are adopted internationally today. The number has decreased from 2004 the number of adoptions internationally by American citizens has decreased by 76%.
So it, it's really been, and there's a lot of um, just government reasons, political reasons within those countries. But there's a lot of children who need hope, uh, a lot of children who need hope. So pretty much what, what we encourage people in the church is do something. Uh, if you feel the call to adopt, you know, pull that thread and see where God leads you. Uh, maybe you're not in a position to adopt, but you know someone who is. Bless them. Uh, bless them financially. Back them up with prayer. Be a supporter and an encourager. But every, everybody can do something and play a role in this. Um, from a parental standpoint, um, what is the first step that a parent needs to do? Now, in my opinion, first step would be to pray. Mm -hmm. But then after that, what do they need to do next mm -hmm. to start this process? I would just say ask questions. I, I would ask questions as far as an agency, uh, ask questions with some friends, yes. and just really develop a checklist of questions. Having, having a, a supportive agency that is involved with your process that, so you don't feel quite so alone, because it is, it's an overwhelming process. Mm -hmm. um, a, and a lot of times, the families that I've talked to, it's the moms, it's the women who are going through the process that do most of the paperwork. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, you know, that is overwhelming. And I think if you can if you can find an agency or find the support that you need around you, um, it it makes the process so much easier. Are there support groups that exist to help? Let's say you know, mom knows this is what God's calling me to do. Um, have to do all of these things to get the home study ready and all of this stuff, and I'm just feeling bogged down. Honestly, uh, like sometimes your your most supportive people through the process aren't necessarily the people within your community because you tend to find people who've gone through the process that may not be like, you know, the ones that live like down the street from you. It's, there's this family who lives in another, in another state that I just connected with who, you know, maybe they're a little bit farther ahead in the process. And I think that's one of the beautiful things about adoption that, you know, we had people who've gone before us who, you know, helped us along the way and that we can turn around and we can now do that for them. We can be that support system for other people. And it's such a unique type of uh, stress and it's such a unique type of um, work that you do with it that even people who are the closest to you and who love you very dearly, uh, they want to support you, they just don't know how. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there, there, are, there are such obscure emotions that come from that. You have fundraising needs that, that can be mounting, but then you have, say you bring the children home and, and you're, you're bringing a child from another country who's lived in an orphanage uh, basically their whole life and there's behavior issues and everything else. Uh, as, as much as friends and family who are close to you might love and support you, they, they just don't know how. And so when you have uh, some other people in adoptive network or families who have been there and done that, they get it. Mm -hmm. and, and so there can just be some very specific detailed uh, help and, and tricks and, and we'll call them life hacks mm -hmm. that, that people have done that have really helped. And so it, what comes with that is emotional support and, and just really, honestly, it's another way of discipleship that mm -hmm. really happens um, through the process. And we definitely have had that from other people. Hopefully, I know we've done that for other people as well, but yeah. uh, boy, it's, it's just such a unique circumstance. Why is it so important for these kids who have been through traumatic situations to be placed in a loving Christian home mm. that can provide them a different view on their life? When, uh, when we adopted our, our first uh, kiddos, so he had Roman and Raya. Roman was a three-year-old boy, and we were told he was deaf. And so we brought him home thinking he was deaf. And one day I just put a pair of headphones on him, and he started kind of rocking with it. So I thought, you're not deaf, there's just another problem. Long story short, he was uh, eligible for a cochlear implant. So the part of the cochlear process is to have an MRI. Well, we gave him an MRI and they came back and they said, uh, it's no cause for alarm, but there was, an, there was an excessive amount of white matter on his brain. And I thought that was interesting. So as I had done the work on my dissertation for this, because um, my dissertation is international adoption and preparing families to do that, uh, what we have seen is that many of these children who grow up in an institutionalized setting, such as an orphanage, have an excess of white matter on the brain versus children who grow up in a home do mm -hmm. not. And essentially what that is, is it, it literally develops and it hurts the brain function. Um, so if I have a feeling of sadness, how that communicates through my brain chemistry uh, to the rest of my body as a normal way, and then there's an abnormal way, joy, you know, laughter, whichever. Um, these children, when they grow up in an orphanage, when they fall and get hurt, there's not a parent to soothe them. Mm. The brain is not given the ability to, to throw out the chemicals. After a while, these children grow up, they process fear differently, they process stress differently, their coping mechanisms are, are torn. 
So a child who has the privilege to grow up with a family versus a child who grows up in an institution, it, it is just a remarkable contrast. And so whenever you can have a child, they might live in an orphanage and have their food, clothing, and, and shelter needs, but they don't have that, that chemistry of love and what mm -hmm. is happening there. And the context of a family, I mean, it is life altering for these children. And we've seen it, and I mean, we have now five uh, who we've adopted and brought home. And, and you see the change, you see the softness take over. Uh, where, where they leave that life of trauma and they're actively healing. Um, our, our oldest boy, I think, is a testament to that. He spent, you know, 16 years of his life uh, away from a family unit, and now just in the year that we've had him home, just watching him become soft uh, and, and the hardness of, of life, and his stories are just remarkable, just issues that he's had in the orphanage and kids who've bullied him or picked on him or things that have happened. And now that he's home, just it's great to see him soft and to, to want to pray and, and to have that desire. And um, that transformation is just remarkable, but it is truly a spiritual transformation to, to watch that happen. But family, when, when a child has an opportunity to grow up in a family as opposed to the cold walls of an orphanage, family is best 100% of the mm -hmm. time. So it's never too late. You can't never. say that, well, the child's been in the orphanage for all these years. Never. This is the way they're going to be. God can do different Because changes. just because like there's an age limit that, you know, oh, they're, they age out. I think China's like four, age 14 and Ukraine is age 16 and they age out. It's like they're, they should be okay on their own. And there's just this sense of identity that bringing them into a family, it gives them an identity. And just, you know, by capping an age on that, um, you know, they can have a, a family, you know, as they grow up and they get married mm -hmm. and as they're having kids. And I think that's, that. And that there's, aspect there's is kind of lost sometimes as well like is, oh, is this child prepared for life outside because just yeah. because you're 16 you know do you know how to cook and clean and do laundry do you know how to maintain a job and, and do you have and a trade and how yeah. are you going to provide for yourself there's just so much that goes into it so mm -hmm. i don't think that there's i don't ever think it's too late it sounds a little bit like god yeah it's never too late it's never too no, late no he was right on time and, and honestly one of the regrets and, and i had told sergey when we brought him home i said buddy i wish i had you 16 years ago <sighs> And he, he grabbed me by the shoulder and he said, but I'm here now. And, and he, it was just such a mature response. And I thought, okay, well, we're going to trust God with this. So we're just going to do our best uh, to be stewards of parents as far as these children's healing and, and trauma and everything. God knows the timing. He knows yeah. what's happened and he knows what you needed to be equipped yeah. to give them what they need from yeah. this point onward. Yeah. Let's talk about this book. Yes. A Biblical, Historical, and Contemporary Review of International Adoption, a do Doctoral doctoral dissertation by Dr. Trevor Littleton. Yes. All right, tell us, tell us about this book. So essentially, <laughs> um, when I had, um, there's a lot of pain and tears that went into this book <laughs> and, and too many late nights. A lot of nights. late nights. Yes. <laughs> um, when, um, when we were over there for our first adoption, um, there was a little girl, the first day we had met Raya, there was a little girl uh, in, a, in a crib. And at the time I thought she was a boy because they had had her head shaved. She was in all gray attire. Um, she was not able to walk. She was restrained there. Uh, our best guess was that she was maybe nine years old, nine, 10. But um, I had, when Shana was talking to Raya, I was looking at this girl and I wanted to give her something like a teddy bear or something to cover her. And so the next day we came back and she was gone. And seeing her, and then later when we were there with Raya, they had an HIV wing in the orphanage where they kept a lot of children with blood disorders. It was actually where Raya stayed. She had hepatitis C, and so they had all the blood disorder children in the same unit. Um, they really did not want anybody to see the kids in there, but the restroom was up there, so mm -hmm. I had to naturally default there. And it was the middle of the day. They had all the curtains closed, and they had all the children just laying in the bed, no toys, no nothing. They were forced literally to remain still and just seeing those situation. And there was another story where there was about 30 kids on a playground and they were all clamoring, mama, papa, mama, papa, Pasha Demoy, which is take me home, take me home. Mm. And it, it was just heartbreaking. So we see all of these horror stories and there were so many that were just much more heinous uh, to even share here. Uh, we came home on a Saturday night. By Tuesday, um, I had already had an approved dissertation for my project, I was already there. I contacted my professor and I said, here's, here's the deal. I'm scrapping everything I've done so far. Um, I, I need to go a totally different direction. That's, a, said, that's a big thing when you're, uh, yeah, when you're doing it's, a dissertation. Yeah, it's a doctoral <laughs> dissertation. So to scrap that was insanity. <laughs> it was a step of faith. But he said, Trevor, you know, you, you can do that. You can prove it. But do you understand your timeline now shortens dramatically because you have a lot of work to do in a little time. 
Um, but I, I just knew that within the church, you know, I've been a pastor for 20 years. And it, it broke my heart thinking all the missions we've supported, all the connections we've had, why have I not been exposed to this? Why have I not heard of this global orphan crisis of these 153 million kids who are without a parent? And what is the church doing for these kids? And what are we doing to mobilize uh, people within our congregation and, and families from other churches or whoever? Are we building a network? Are we coaching people? Are we discipling people? And, and just something had to be done. So I, a lot of late nights. I actually think in our bedroom, I moved in a fridge. I he put did. a fridge on the end table. I brought a bookcase in. You had a, you had a, a he, ta he had extra tables and he had. I went to the church and I got a couple was, uh, music racks and I had iPads and oh books yeah, that's all right. stacked up. It was ridiculous. It's like, you know, so, 2.30, 3 o'clock in the morning and he's, I hear, We would you know, put the kids to bed and, at nine o'clock and I would stay up from nine to 3 a.m. every morning. <laughs> or every night and morning just working on it to get it done. But the burden was there, there just was so much. There, there is so much that families need to know. There are so many children. And now we've been blessed to see so many of our friends and family who've gone and who've hosted, who've adopted, who've done some of this other work. And to see, like, I get, I get teary-eyed every time I see a family who I know. They adopt a kid, they bring them home, and it's like there's another situation that uh, God is truly blessing and doing something great with. And it's, it's really been a blessing to see that. But there's just so much that needs to be done. And seeing, seeing it, uh, one of the phrases that I've coined, and I shared it uh, when I preached an orphan Sunday at our church, is I really believe that the threshold to hell is seconds within an orphanage. Mm -hmm. And I, I believe that. I've seen that. When you see the loneliness and, and the actual hopelessness that is there, uh, it is, it is heart-wrenching. Well, we are just about out of time, but would you close by praying? Let's pray for the children that still need homes. Yes. Let's pray for the families that God is calling or will be calling for this. Let's pray for the future of these kids and these families. Let's do that. All right. Heavenly Father, we just pray so much right now that you would go before us. And Father, that you would stir the hearts of millions uh, of Christians across this great nation, of Christians around the globe, to have a heart for the orphan. Father, that you would open up a special calling within their lives and their hearts and let them know that you are the governor of finances and you are the governor of time they would have to take off work and you are the author of the stories of the children who they will one day meet. And Father, we just pray that you would do a remarkable supernatural act, that you would compare and combine uh, the families who are, who are needing to, to look for children, the children who need families. Father, that you would pair them together and, and weave their stories together in a way that only you could. Father, we pray that you would give hope uh, to the children who, who need hope. And we pray that you would give guidance, direction, and the calling that comes from your spirit to those children, or to those families who, who are ready to adopt and begin that adventure. And we just pray that you would bless them abundantly. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.